Uh, live Nativity being held on September 17th, um, 5 to 7 p.m. I saw a sign-up sheet at the front door for anyone planning on participating in that. If you or your family knows anyone that needs ministering this week, contact Danny. My number's there or any of the deacons this week as well. November birthdays are there at the bottom. I don't believe anybody's today. So flipping over to the back, looking at the prayer list. Does anyone have any corrections, anyone to take off, or anyone to add? Any other additions or corrections? thankful for this, this season of Thanksgiving, dear God, that you that you let us have, dear, for, dear Father. We're so thankful to God for your love and your compassions and your many blessings, the, the behind the scenes, Lord, in your life that you do for us, Lord, that we don't even give you credit for, dear God, Lord, that we give you credit for now, dear Father. We thank you for our family, dear God, and for our church family, dear Lord, that you can just continue to bless them, dear God, and continue to be with them, Lord, like you can, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, for salvation, dear God, Lord, but most of all, Lord, we thank you for Continuing blessing us throughout the year. In your name, amen.
Thanksgiving holiday. I know that our house did. We had uh, all of my family and, and my in-laws were all under one roof, which was really cool because we all get along. I know that doesn't often happen, but we do. Uh, it was a great time. I was really thankful for it. I'm also uh, thankful to be back here with all of you this morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know or you might be visiting, my name is Danny Pace. I'm the pastor uh, here at the church, and it's good to have you in worship. To our regulars, uh, to those who might be guests, to our online community who will be watching later, uh, welcome to all of you. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Uh, turn to the book of Mark, the book of Mark. Now, I know, don't worry, <laughs> some of you are here in Mark and you're getting some PTSD. Uh, uh, so yeah, we were in Mark for most of uh, this year, I think, on Wednesday nights. Uh, and so don't worry, I'm not starting some new sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. But I do want to share from Mark chapter 7 today. Uh, Mark chapter 7. Uh, it's a sermon that we're calling, That Which Defiles. That Which Defiles. Boy, that sounds pleasant, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds like you're in for a good one. Uh, defiles. Uh, that word really doesn't sit well with us. It, it has this immediate... Uh, negative connotation, and it should, it should. The word defile means to spoil or, or pollute or to, to dirty something. Uh, but when it comes to sacred things and to holy things, it has a slightly more nuanced context. It means to desecrate something, to violate it, to profane or, or debase it, to cause it to become impure and no longer holy. Today, Jesus is going to have quite a bit to say about things that defile what is holy and about what is holy. We're going to read it together. Chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, beginning with verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And he replied, Isaiah was right. When he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. Let's skip on down to verse 14. We'll get back to those other ones later on. Verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. If anyone has ears to ear, let him hear. 
after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of their body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil comes Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and they defile a person. Pray with me. Father, I pray, Lord, as we read this passage and we examine your word this morning, that we'd be ever mindful of the Holy Spirit's conviction as he speaks to us in our own lives about things which defile us. Father God, I pray that we would not take this passage lightly, that we would not think of it as something for someone else to hear, but that, Lord, we would listen to it with our own ears and our own hearts, and that we would allow Holy Spirit to work through us, showing us ways in which we need to repent and to break free from cycles of sin in our own life, things that would defile us. And so, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that we'd be obedient. Father God, I pray, Lord, that we would just have a desire to follow you in holiness and righteousness. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. I pray this in your name. Amen. So here's the setup. Uh, you need to know that the, the ancient Jews loved rules, and they had rules for everything, dating all the way back to the time of Moses and, and Old Testament. They had rules for how to eat, how to work, how to worship, how to get along, and, and a whole heap of other things. But these rules, these, these laws, were basically broken down into three categories three categories there was the civil law the moral law and the ceremonial law which basically means they had laws regarding how to get along with one another they had laws regarding holiness and sin and then they had laws on how to conduct themselves in worship and in ritual the civil laws and the ceremonial laws of the Bible were, were for a particular time and place. They were culturally relevant to a time period, not to us, which is why we don't require women to cover their heads when they come into church and why we don't jump all over our Christian brothers and sisters when they go to a clam bake or eat oysters, right? We don't follow those rules anymore. The civil the ceremonial laws were basically set up so that the Israelites could get along with each other, so that there would be order, so that they could stand apart from the surrounding pagan tribes, and so that people could prosper, even be healthy. There was rules regarding health. The moral laws, on the other hand, the moral laws centered on the laws given to Moses by God, to the people through Moses and through the Ten Commandments. These were the laws that governed what it meant to be holy and free from sin. These are the laws that we still observe today, the moral law and the ones at the heart of today's passage. See, the religious leaders bring Jesus a concern regarding ceremonial law and Jesus is quick to correct them about what's truly important to holiness, that which truly defiles. That's what we're talking about. And so let's look back again at, at Mark. We're going to pick back up at verse 1 and read those first few verses again. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. 
the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So here's, so here's the issue, right? So the religious leaders were forever concerned with things that might make them ceremonially unclean. And, and there were laws in place to make sure that this did not happen. Certain foods were unclean, and so they didn't eat them. Certain practices were unclean, and so they refrained from those things. Certain things were unclean, and so they were hyper aware of everything that they touched and where they went and what they handled. Thus, the hand washing. They were rigorous about it, all the way up to the elbow, right? It was in order to make sure that their food was clean to eat. They would wash their hands, guaranteeing that any accidental contact they had with something unclean would be taken care of. And herein lies the point. Because see, the religious leaders expected, demanded the same behavior from any Jew who considered themselves devout. And therein lies the question. Uh, Jesus, uh, <laughs> why aren't you guys washing their hands? They were eating with defiled hands. Ew, right? But this was more than just a ew. This was more than just stopping the spread of germs. It was a matter of principle. If your hands were unclean, then your food was unclean. And therefore, you were putting unclean food into your body and you were unclean. The accusation was a slam against Jesus' disciples and thus against Jesus himself. And this didn't go well with the religious leaders, <laughs> as you can imagine, right? Jesus has a comment, a few things to say. Uh, picking back up in verse 6, this is his immediate response to him. He replies, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. That makes friends, not enemies, right? As it was written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Let's read that again. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain because their teachings are merely human rules. These Pharisees, these scribes were were so caught up with man-made rules and traditions taught by elders as they admit in verse 5 that they're more than happy to point out Jesus' failure to comply with them. To which Jesus says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. See, they were far from perfect themselves. They were neglecting the very laws that they claimed to exemplify. And Jesus tells them as much. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He says, they talk a good talk, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is hollow and it's empty because they're just following rules made by man. They're following traditions. And even more so, Jesus tells them that they're guilty of a higher law, the moral law, remember? The law that God had passed down from on high to Moses. The law concerning sin and that which governed our holiness. Your hands might be clean, Jesus says, but your hearts are full of sin. Wow. Now that you've got a better grasp on the context, let's read that part that we skipped over. It's going to make so much more sense to you, I promise. Verse 9. And he, that's Jesus, continued... You have a fine way of setting aside the, aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. 
For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that's devoted to God, then you no longer ask them to do anything for their father or mother. And thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. What does all that mean? The Ten Commandments state clearly to honor your father and mother. Why? Because it's the foundation for learning how to love and to respect all people. By learning to honor and to love and to respect the first people that God has put into your life, the most important people, you learn what that looks like to everyone one of the most sacrificial ways that you can show that love and honor and respect to your parents is by taking care of them toward the end of their lives when they will need you the most when you're most able to return the love and care that they have shown to you and this was true in the ancient Judaic world as well Grown children would financially provide for and care for their aging, ailing parents. It was set up that this was good and it was holy and it was righteous. And that is unless, <laughs> unless you claim that your money is Corbin, apparently. Now, now, we don't know exactly what that word means. It isn't really explained or fleshed out anywhere else in Scripture. But, but praise the Lord, we get an idea here in this text right here. It's money that we are told is set aside for God. And so therefore, we can kind of understand, scholars can kind of kind of figure out exactly what's going on here based on the culture and this term and what it's used for. In other words, the adult children could claim that their money was wrapped up in God's business. And it provided them a loophole. It could be used elsewhere. And basically, They were dismissed from having to care for their parents. And their parents would be left destitute and penniless, which is against God's moral law. Two things. Number one, this seemed to be a rule that the religious leaders particularly took advantage of and enjoyed the spoils of. Because Jesus directly links this idea to them they likely get some of that money. And that's why they like this law. Number two, there was nothing to prove that your money had been used for the temple or for God. And so you were essentially using God as an excuse to neglect the very commands of God. Talk about hypocrisy. Talk about blasphemy to drive home the point that the religious leaders were wrong and and that their blasphemous behavior was the greater trespass, Jesus speaks further in verses 14 and 15. He says, again, Jesus crawled the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. Jesus expounds on his teaching even further when he explains these same words to his confused disciples a few verses later. Back in verse 20, He went on and he told his disciples, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it was... For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and greed and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy and slander and arrogance and folly. All of these evils come from inside. And they defile a person. You've got to see this, folks. Because Jesus is talking about food and unwashed hands while at the same time he is not talking about food or unwashed hands at all he's making a statement 
about that which is truly clean and what is unclean. The cleanliness of your hands has nothing to do with the cleanliness of your heart. The food that you eat has nothing to do with the conditions of your heart. And that is what God cares about. Outward appearances of cleanliness mean nothing to God. He is concerned with our hearts. We talked about this when we read over the Sermon on the Mount a few weeks back. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has yet another confrontation with the religious leaders and he expresses this sentiment again. He chastises them even more harshly in Matthew chapter 23. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the dish and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones and death and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Is it possible for Jesus to make it any more clear? Talk is cheap. Looks can be deceiving. But the heart, the heart gives us away every time. Our lives cannot conceal what our hearts are full of. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with three major takeaways this morning, church. None of which should be taken lightly. The first is this. Adhering to man-made rules and religious traditions do not make you clean. Brandishing your knowledge of church history or of the Bible won't get you into heaven. Your plethora of Sunday school pins and your voting record and your nightly, nicely pressed church clothes don't make you clean. It is the cross of Jesus. It is by the cross of Jesus that we are saved. It's the repentance of sin it's the confession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And it's the surrendering to the Holy Spirit so that He might have open heart surgery in your life. I say that to say this second. It's possible to have clean hands and still have a dirty heart. It's possible to call Him Lord while at the same time having no knowledge of who He really is or any genuine evidence of Him in your heart. Yes, we are called to love others. Yes, we are meant to readily exemplify Christ's love in our lives and to those around us. But by Jesus' own words, we are also called to be people who are sexually pure, who are honest, who are humble, who are full of grace, who are holy, who are self-controlled, who are meek, who are kind, and who are lovers of godly things. Am I making it up? That was a pretty extensive list that Jesus gave us. Maybe the outside of your cup is clean, but how's the inside? What does it look like? Thirdly and lastly, we can't allow our man-made rules and our religious traditions to stand in the way of the gospel. If we do, God will remove us from his work. 
He will not allow us to be a hindrance in his saving work. And just as Jesus was stern with the religious leaders, God will bring correction on us if we muddy the gospel message up with things that are non-essential. And oftentimes, the church today is no different than the religious leaders of the past. We have our own ideas of what we deem clean, what we sanction as unclean, what, what we point out as errors in, in anyone who doesn't measure up to our standards. They don't pray correctly. They don't read the right translation of the Bible. They don't go to the right church or the right service. They don't dress the right way. They don't tie the right amount. They don't worship the right way. They don't vote the right way. They don't have the right theology. They don't, 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 don't. And all the while God is saying, enough 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 with your whitewashed tombs for what is coming out of you is far from clean it reeks of death and decay and it smells of a heart that is far from God and this cannot be church it cannot be I'll leave you with this because it reminds us of what we should be. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphant procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We are not to smell of death and decay. We are to smell of Christ. And so let us possess the aroma of Christ, church. The aroma of Christ. So that everywhere you go and in every interaction you have, that aroma lingers in the air. That is what we're to be about, both inside and out. As we stand, as we worship, and as you respond to the Holy Spirit.